In this video, we will review the bony anatomy of the shoulder girdle. The bones discussed will include the clavicle, the scapula, and the humerus. We will also take a brief look at the sternum. The sternum is a flat, elongated bone that forms the anterior portion of the thoracic cage. It may be subdivided into the manubrium, body, and xiphoid process. The xiphoid process, although small and thin, can vary significantly among individuals in size and shape. The upper portion of the sternum, known as the manubrium, is marked by the jugular notch, also known as suprasternal notch, and by the sternoclavicular joint where the proximal end of the clavicle meets the manubrium of the sternum. The clavicle serves as the only connection between the upper extremity and the axial skeleton. Its proximal end, located here, meets the manubrium of the sternum at the sternoclavicular joint. The distal end of the clavicle meets the acromion process of the scapula at the acromioclavicular joint. By removing the clavicle here, we can note its S-shaped body, with the medial portion convex anteriorly and the lateral portion convex posteriorly. The ends of the clavicle may also be named for the bones with which they connect the medial end of the clavicle being referred to as its sternal end and the broad, flat, lateral end of the clavicle being referred to as the acromial end as it meets the acromion process of the scapula at the acromioclavicular joint. The scapula is a roughly triangular bone located on the posterior lateral wall of the thorax. It is marked by three angles, a superior angle, an inferior angle, and a lateral angle whose most prominent feature is the glenoid cavity or socket for the ball and socket glenohumeral joint. It also has three borders, a superior border, a medial border, and a lateral border. The medial border, which faces towards the spine, may also be referred to as the vertebral border, while the lateral border, which faces towards the axilla or armpit, may be referred to as the axillary border. This prominent ridge of bone is known as the spine of the scapula. It terminates in the broad, flat acromion process. Lying above and below the spine of the scapula are shallow depressions in the bone, normally filled with muscle tissue. This shallow depression above the spine is known as the supraspinous fossa, while this shallow depression below the spine is known as the infraspinous fossa. A third fossa, located on the anterior surface of the scapula and facing the rib cage, is known as the subscapular fossa. We'll rotate this model to see again the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity which forms part of the glenohumeral joint. Taking a closer look in the region of the glenohumeral joint, we can see the head of the scapula, the broadened lateral portion surrounding the glenoid. Proximal to that, we see this tapered region, slightly narrower, known as the neck of the scapula. Above and below the glenoid, we see two raised roughened areas that serve as sites for muscle attachment. This one, lying just above the glenoid fossa, is known as the supraglenoid tubercle and serves as the origin for the long head of the biceps tendon. This one, just below the glenoid fossa is known as the infraglenoid tubercle and serves as the attachment site 
for the long head of the triceps tendon. Switching to an anterior view, we see this prominent beak-like projection of bone known as the coracoid process. It serves as an attachment site for several muscles, including the short head of the biceps brachii. In our final view of the scapula, we note the suprascapular notch. Located where the superior border of the scapula meets the base of the coracoid process. In anatomy, the term arm refers to the section between the shoulder and the elbow. The humerus, therefore, is the only bone of the arm. This video, which focuses on the shoulder, will explore the details of the proximal portion of the humerus, while a subsequent video on the elbow will detail the distal humerus. The most proximal portion of the humerus is this large, rounded, articular projection known as the humeral head. It is covered in smooth, articular, or hyaline cartilage. Just distal to the head of the humerus, the tapered area here, is known as the anatomical neck. While most bones are described only as having one neck, the humerus tapers again here in a region that is more commonly fractured and is therefore referred to as the surgical neck. Two large roughened areas on the proximal humerus that serve as sites for muscle attachment are noted here. This one is referred to as the lesser tubercle, and this one, located more laterally, is referred to as the greater tubercle. The indentation between the tubercles may be referred to as the intertubercular groove or as the bicipital groove as the long head of the biceps travels through this groove as it descends from the supraglenoid tubercle into the anterior arm. The mid portion of the humerus may be referred to as the shaft, and roughly halfway down the shaft on the lateral side is a raised roughened area known as the deltoid tuberosity, which serves as an attachment site for the deltoid muscle. Finally, the posterior aspect of the humerus is marked by a shallow indentation known as the radial groove where the radial nerve passes. Moving to the left arm of a painted model, we can see that the radial groove lies between the medial and lateral heads of the triceps brachii muscle.